And thank you, Sydney and family, for being with us today. They were here at the early service, so that's, that's, <laughs> they've already sat through my message once. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever been on the beneficiary end of benevolence, but if you have been, you know what a blessing that can be, especially if, if times were really tough for you during that particular time. And oftentimes, those who have been on the receiving end understand just how much of a blessing it is when people give to them. But people on the giving end sometimes receive a blessing as well. Jesus said himself, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And, and so both the giver and the recipient can be blessed. But this morning, I want to talk about uncommon sharing, that is giving. Because giving can be a big blessing to those who are in need. And here in the book of Acts, as we continue our study through this book, we've come upon a segment of scripture where it encourages by example, not, not necessarily by precept, but by example, the idea of giving and giving sacrificially, giving in an uncommon way. And I say uncommon because when we read through this, you'll see not many people give the way these believers here in Acts chapter 4 gave. Acts chapter 4, we're at 32 through 37 this morning. Verses 32 through 37. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together today as believers in Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. We thank you for the salvation he has provided and your Holy Spirit who enlightens our mind to the truth of your scripture. And so now, Father, we pray and ask that your Holy Spirit would do exactly that, that he would enlighten us as to the scripture's meaning here, correct meaning and correct application for each and every individual life that's represented here today. Father, help us to put into practice the things that we learn. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are at least five principles I think we can walk away with this morning from studying this particular text. The first is that unity, generosity, and boldness in witnessing are all the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Unity, generosity, and boldness are all the result of being filled with with God's Holy Spirit. Secondly, the unity that we see here wasn't just a theological unity, but it was also a unity of kindred heart, a unity, if you will, of compassion. They were one in heart and mind. Thirdly, their sharing was voluntary, and that's an important point in the political culture and, and, and changing day and age in which we live in. Their sharing was voluntary. Fourthly, their sharing was an act of worship. And finally, the distribution of what they shared was voluntarily given to spiritual leaders to be distributed based on need. And so let's look at the text then and these principles that we find in this text. First of all, unity, generosity, and boldness and witnessing are all a result of being filled with God's Spirit. In verses 31 through 33, the text says, After they prayed, and re you remember last week we looked at that prayer, that prayer for boldness, but with the maybe unexpected, unattended consequence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. 
Note in this passage that they were filled with the Holy Spirit as a result of praying. All of us have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week. All of us have been permanently, let me add that, permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is no such thing as a believer who doesn't have the Holy Spirit or an unbeliever who does have the Holy Spirit. We, we have the Spirit of God the moment that we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior in a unique way to the New Testament era that is a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we are not all filled with the Spirit. We talked about that earlier in chapter 2, that being filled with the Spirit is different than being indwelt by the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit involves being controlled by the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is a moment by moment, day by day, month by month, year by year experience. It can happen over and over and over and over again, and it ought to, <laughs> right? Continually be sought. And so here we see the believers as they prayed for boldness were filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about the fact that the reason for that was is that the Spirit is the Spirit of boldness. That God has not given us a spirit of timidity but of boldness. And so the Spirit is what gave them the boldness to witness as the text tells us here that they spoke the Word of God boldly. But it also helped them in the area of unity and generosity. Now another interesting thing about this passage is, is as you think about the believers here and, and, and how they lived out their Christian life as exhibited in this particular text. Now, did they live this way for the rest of their lives? I don't know. But the fact they lived their way the way they did here and now in this text is amazing. This kind of generosity is not common, is it? I mean, how many of you have sold your house at one time or another to give to the poor? Anybody? No. <laughs> How many of you have sold lands to give to the poor? Maybe, and you don't have to raise your hand. But I would, I would dare say very few. Very, very few of it. Now, is it mandated? No, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But the, it, is, it does seem to be held in high esteem in, in that these people are being uh, recorded in Scripture, I think, as an example for believers to come, for those of us that are, were, are alive today and those that lived after them. And, and so it is an example uh, uh, and uh, they, we, see, we see this kind of uncommon generosity, this uncommon share, but it, it's a result of being filled with the Spirit, but it's exhibited in the life of new believers. These aren't people who have been believers for years. I mean, the gospel is just now being preached. It's just starting to spread through the world, right? The apostles, this isn't long after the day of Pentecost. Some of these people may have only been believers for a month or two or, or maybe a couple weeks. And yet they're living in a manner that is, what would you say, more of an example of Christian unity, generosity, and boldness than maybe many Christians who have been believers for years and years and years and years. What makes the difference? The filling of the Holy Spirit. Being submissive and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that, I think, is notable. That, that, that within this short period of time, Something caused a change in their lives that caused them to do that which most people will never ever do. They were selling their homes or selling their lands, some of them. They were sharing their possessions uh, with other believers who were in need. And so they were sacrificing to a, a large extent, to a greater degree than what many people will ever sacrifice. And yet they're new believers. They can't be old believers. The church hasn't been around long enough. I mean, I don't even think we can get a year between Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost and Acts chapter 4. It appears to be months at the most. Even if it is a year, most of the time we would say that a Christian is usually a baby Christian. Uh, we would consider them a baby Christian for the first couple years, usually, right? I mean, usually the growing process isn't that quick. It takes a while. And, and yet these people, again, are living in, in, in a... Um, an uncommon way with an uncommon generosity. The second thing we see is that their unity wasn't just a theological unity, it was also a unity of a kindred heart, a unity of compassion. Note again, verse 32, it says, All believers were one in heart and mind. And so uh, they agreed on those theological principles that were essential uh, to the Bible and to their Christian life. Uh, they, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that He had died for their sins, 
that he had been crucified and, and risen and, and ascended into heaven. And, and all of this was somewhat new to them, but they all, they all grabbed it and agreed because they, they were one in mind and heart. And so they were, there was a theological unity, but there was more than just a theological unity. You can have a theological unity without having the same heart, uh, the same kind of, and I'm taking heart here to mean compassion based on the text. The fact that they were selling their possessions and, and giving to the poor. And if they didn't sell their possessions and give to the poor, they were sharing them. They didn't sell everything. And in some cases, they, it says that in verse 32, but they shared everything that they had. And so there's this uncommon sharing, this uncommon benevolence that we don't see oftentimes even in mature Christians. And, and so that's the heart part, I think. They had the same compassion, the same unity of thought in relationship to theology and the same kind of heart and desire uh, to be compassionate to those who were in need. And again, what produced this? It wasn't a near-death experience. They weren't driving up I-95 and almost killed in an accident. <laughs> so they decided to change the priorities of their life. Now, does that happen? Yeah, and sometimes it produces really good results, doesn't it? Sometimes people have near-death experiences that change their life and, and for the better. And sometimes we can say even may, maybe that that bad thing that happened happened for a good reason. But that's not the cause here, is it? It's not a near-death experience. It's, it's, not, it's nothing other than the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. And it causes this unity and uh, this compassion, the same mind and same heart. Oh, uh, what every church needs what every church needs, this kind of compassion, this kind of unity that we see here in this passage, this kind of um, care for the other believers. Thirdly, we see it, that the sharing was voluntary. Now, I, I added this point on purpose because some people have used this passage as a basis for a political agenda. And so let's take a look at this idea that their sharing was voluntary. In verse 34, it says, there were no needy persons among them from time to time. Note that phrase. I think that's essential to understanding that it was voluntary. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed as anyone, to anyone as he had need. You'll note that they didn't all go out and instantly sell their homes and lands. Oh, look, we've got to do this. This is what Christians do. We all, come on, let's all go to the real estate agent. How many are joining me today? No. <laughs> Uh, they're closed on Sunday. Shoo! Got out of that one. <laughs> uh, they, they didn't all, you know, put their houses up. From time to time is key to understanding it's voluntary. But the rest of the text gives us even more information about the voluntary nature of their giving. Jump down just a few verses. We're in chapter 4, verse 34. But now jump down to chapter 5, verse 4. Now, actually, before we look at it, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? two very popular people in the early church, apparently, and they wanted to maintain their popularity. Uh, so when they sold their house or their land, uh, they pretended to give all of it to the apostles. They came and laid it at the apostles' feet as well, but they didn't really give all of it. They kept some of it. But in verse 4, I think we can see clearly the idea that this sharing and this giving that we're reading about just a few verses early earlier is voluntary because look at what he says look at what the apostles say in verse 4 they say to Ananias and Sapphira this is before they're struck dead obviously didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold wasn't the money at your disposal now note the phrase didn't it belong to you before it was sold you see the Bible's not against personal ownership of property in fact, I believe the Bible supports the idea of individual private ownership. And so when socialists and communists try to convey the idea that, that, that that's only a result of greedy human beings, now I, I understand greed can be involved in it, but when they, when they try to hold this up, as Karl Marx and Frederick, uh, Friedrich Engels did in their book, The Communist Manifesto, which spurred on the communist revolutions around the world that, that resulted in communism in the Soviet Union and in China and North Korea, um, when they try to use these verses as a proof text for their political ideology, they do injustice to the scripture. In fact, I think they become unwitting pawns of Satan. 
and, and they misrepresent the scriptures because they're only looking at one aspect of what that passage is teaching and they're not looking at the whole idea that it was voluntary. It wasn't the bourgeoisie saying how the money should be spent. It wasn't the dictatorship of the proletariat saying how the money should be spent. It wasn't one group or the other collecting all the wealth and redistributing it on an equal basis. And this was voluntary. No government agency said you've got to turn everything in. No rebellion forces came along, like the, the revolutions that took place in those countries uh, uh, where, where there was an uprising and the people were spurred on by the works. You know, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels advocated revolution because they saw it as the, the end result of the class struggles throughout the history of planet Earth. That the proletariat, the working class, always eventually rose up against uh, the, the ruling class or the haves, those people who controlled industry. And they even saw a, a little bit of maybe um, you know, deception, or not deception, but manipulation on the part of the, the ruling class and that the, the means of production were constantly changing and they liked that because that allowed them to stay in control of the means of protect, pr production and the uneducated classes, the working classes then stayed poor, they stayed rich, they did it all for personal profit and personal gain. And that's all wrong, it's all bad, it's all the result of greed and even the Bible teaches that everybody ought to share everything equal. And so, hey, you guys, go out there. Let's rise up against the government. Let's take control and redistribute the wealth ourselves in a way that we see as right and fair and equal. Who's with me? Nobody. Okay. You've heard better speeches before, right? <laughs> but it's worked in some countries with better speakers than me, more charismatic, more evil without knowing it more the pawns of Satan. And so we have those communists. The Bolshevik Revolution was a result of that. People buying into this philosophy. And, and it's supported in part in, in, by Marx and Engels. They, they quote from this passage in Acts. But they miss the fact that it's voluntary. It's not a political group of people saying you must do this. Now even though it's a good thing, it's a, it's a great thing. Scripture highlights it as, as being a good thing, but it's voluntary. And I believe that's clearly taught, if not in the fact that it says from time to time in verse 34, certainly in the fact that, that the apostles say in verse 4 of chapter 5, didn't belong to you before it was sold, and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal. They could have kept it. And they wouldn't have been struck dead for that. They, they weren't struck dead for... Um, because they didn't give all the money, they were struck dead because they pretended to give all the money. Right? They could have come to the apostles. The indication is here. It wasn't, so it wasn't the money at your disposal. They could have come and said, look, we sold our house for 100000 Pastor Dean, here's 50000 for you to give to anybody in grace that needs it. That would have been honest. Now, that wouldn't have been hypocritical. It wouldn't have been deceptive. But no, Ananias and Sapphira wanted to look better than maybe they really were. They had a, a hypocriticalness about them that we see so often condemned in Scripture by Jesus. And, and so they wanted people to think, ooh, look at what we did. And, and so they gave some of the money, saying that they gave all of the money. So they lied. They lied. And that's why God strikes them dead. God punishes them severely, not because they didn't give everything, but because they pretended to give everything. And so there's deception and deceit and lying. And, and the Holy Spirit was saying very early in the life of the church, he said, well, why don't people die today? Why, you know, if it's something, it's something like giving. You know, when people are pretentious with their giving today, how come they're not all being struck dead? The, the answer is because I think God was trying to send a message to the early church of the seriousness of it to set a pattern. And if he struck everybody dead that was pretentious, maybe there wouldn't be any believers around. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, wow. There's some pretty severe things that happen in the scripture over certain things. I, I think I mean, even going back to the Old Testament with, with Moses and you know, when Aaron and Miriam complain, boom, God deals with them pretty pretty harshly, doesn't he? And and that some of the plagues and the earth opening up and swallowing some of the Israelites. And, in the, in the life of the early church, God, I think it's God saying, hey, this is serious. Pay attention here. I don't want you to pretend to be something that you're not. I don't want you to be 
pretentious in your spirituality. Don't try to pass yourself off as something you're not. Be, be honest with God and be honest with others. And, and so, again, sort of sidelighted there, but it, it's the idea that the giving was voluntary, that private ownership is allowed in the Scriptures. In fact, the, the Eighth Commandment would be of no effect if it wasn't for private ownership. What is the Eighth Commandment, everybody? Thou shall not, it relates to this sermon, so <laughs> you can probably guess it. Thou shall not steal, right? Thou shall not steal. Uh, how can you steal something if there's no private ownership? If I don't own it, you can't steal it, right? Now, the only way you can steal it is if I own it. And so I think the Bible allows for private ownership because of its prohibition against stealing. In fact, not only does it allow for private ownership, but it has some severe penalties for theft. Those penalties are, are restitution, but listen to the kind of restitution that the Bible teaches. In Exodus 22, right after the Ten Commandments are given, in verses 1 through 3, it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, so he no longer has it, he can't give it back, he must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. So that's four to five times as much as he took. Can you imagine if the courts awarded every victim of theft four to five times as much as what was taken from them? Not just you've got to pay it back, but you've got to pay it back in triplicate or you've got to quadruple it. Now, if the animal was found alive, there's a different penalty. It's a little less. Verse 4 says, if the stolen animal is found alive in his possession, whether ox or donkey or sheep, he must pay back double. So the smallest penalty of restitution is at least twice as much. What happens if they couldn't pay it? It tells you what's to happen if they can't pay it. Verse 3. This is Exodus 22, verse 3. But if it, ha well, it's, it's in the context that too, if, if the thief that steals, if he's caught breaking in at, at uh, if he's caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed if it happens at night. But if it happens after sunrise, he is guilty of bloodshed. And then it goes on. A thief must certainly make restitution, but if he has nothing, sometimes people steal because they have nothing. If he has nothing, he must be sold to pay for his theft. Now that's not permanent life slavery. Unless he stole a whole lot, I guess, right? That's until he can pay back at least double or more. And so he was to be, you know, I've mentioned before, forced slavery, lifelong forced slavery of a free people is biblically wrong. But in relationship to criminal cases, there were some cases where God ordered, allowed for, a person to be sold into slavery to make restitution to the victim for the damages they had done. And we think of all slavery as being bad in all cases. But what happens, I mean, how many people are victims of crimes that never get restitution? You know, the guy may go to jail. Now here he didn't go to jail. I'd rather not go to jail and be able to work off my debt than go to jail, to be honest with you. I'm getting too old, and I don't want to go to jail at this age. <laughs> I hear bad things happen in jail. But, so I'd rather be free to work it off. So slavery, in some cases, may be the more compassionate form of penalty. Again, it's not a lifelong slavery. It's until he pays back whatever amount he has to pay back. But there's that idea, then, of there wouldn't be these kind of penalties if God did not allow for personal ownership. And so personal ownership is not an anti-biblical concept. The scriptures allow for it and reinforce it in, in many places. And so that's why I say it's important to understand here that what the believers did was pure, purely voluntary. They did not have to sell their stuff. It wasn't against God's laws or God's ideas for you to own something. I mean, if it was, we'd all be in sin right now, right? How many of you own a car? How many own a house? How many own a vacant lot? Wow, not many. Okay. How many of you own a bicycle? <laughs> okay. So we all own something. Are we living contrary to the will of God? No, we're allowed to own things. <clears throat> Scripture allows for that. And if I want to give it away, if I want to sell it and give the proceeds away, I'm allowed to do that and encouraged to do that to meet the needs of others. So what believers did was purely voluntary. Fourthly, fourthly, as we continue through this passage, their sharing was an act of worship. It was voluntary and it was an act of worship. You say, where in the world do you get that from, from this passage? 
Look again at verses 34 and 35. It says, There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it, note this next phrase, isn't this kind of an odd way to give? And put it at the apostles' what? Feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now I've done some reading on this, and a lot of commentaries just skip over this. A lot of commentaries just treat it as if they just sold it and gave the money to the apostles. I think there's a reason for why it says they put it at the apostles' feet. I think what it indicates, it's not that they're worshiping the apostles, it's not that they're coming down and you know, we can envision them laying the gift down. That, that would be worshiping man. They're not allowed to do that. But I think that by their, their laying the gift at the apostles' feet, what they're doing is they're relinquishing control. They're saying, this belongs to God to help the poor. You guys help the poor with it. They're relinquishing control. They're recognizing that everything that they have ultimately belongs to God. In fact, I think that's indicated when it says, in the text that says... Um, that they didn't treat any of their possessions as their own. Just backing up here um, in verse 32, no one claimed that any of his possessions was his, was his own. Now, obviously, they recognized they were the own because they continued to own some of the stuff. So what does he mean by that? He mean, they recognized that it ultimately belonged to God. Whatever you have ultimately belongs to God. You are a steward of it. You are a steward of it. And as stewards of it, they, they recognized that they could do good with it, that they could help accomplish God's will with it. And they brought it, and they gave up complete control of it to the apostles and, and, and laid it at their feet. And so I see that as an act of worship. That's what giving is. When we give money and we say, you know what, God, this is for your purposes, isn't it? and we give up control. Because sometimes people like to control what they do with their money, and it's not an act of worship necessarily. It can still accomplish good things and good purposes but they want to control it. They want to use it as they want to use it, rather than just saying, God, this is yours, to, you know, use these men to, to distribute it in a, in a way that you see fit. Again, it's voluntary. This is not a political organization. We'll talk about that as, as we go on. These are spiritual men that they trusted uh, to help relieve the needs of the saint. But I see it as an act of worship. In fact, I see that in other passages of Scripture where, where believers who gave did it uh, as an act of worship. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and following. It says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. In other words, they were sacrificing. It wasn't just, they didn't just give their excess. They gave more than their excess in this case. Again, it was voluntary. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely, and this is why I say it's voluntary, verse 3, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. This wasn't some pastor up there beating them over the head. You've got to give. You've got to give more. We got building payments. We got electric payments. We got salaries. I need a new jet. You've got to give more. Right? I just sort of threw the new jet in there. It was, okay, I'll reduce it. Just, I, a new motorcycle. Now, it wasn't some pastor beating them o o over the head with it. It's entirely on the own. They pleaded. They are the ones that pleaded with the apostles for the privilege. Do we think of giving as being a privilege? For the privilege of sharing. I can be honest with you. I don't always think of giving as a privilege. You know, if, if I didn't know better, I would think I was Dutch. You know, you, know, you know what I mean by that, right? The, all the jokes about the Dutch. You heard about, the, anyway, never mind. You can look it up in a joke book. You'll see so. You know, just stingy. And that, t that tends to be in my DNA a little bit. I'm just a little bit stingy. Ask my wife. And uh, so I don't always think of it as a privilege to give. But here the Macedonians did, and they pleaded with the apostles to give. And it says entirely on their own. Verse 5, it goes on and it says, And they did not do as we expected, but they, and here's where I see the worship, they gave themselves first to the Lord. They didn't just say, okay, there's a need, I got some extra money, here you go, guys. Send it out, help those poor people, they need it. No, they first gave themselves to the Lord. And then they wanted to give. And so I, I see worship very much involved in our giving. I think all of our giving ought to be, to some extent or another, an act of worship. 
And, and that's what I think we see here in this passage as well. Now, I want to clarify again, giving it to the apostles doesn't seem to be mandated either. And you say, well, why do you believe that? Because uh, based on the teachings of Jesus, I think they could have taken their own, I think Ananias and Sapphira could have taken their own money and distributed it to help the needs of others, and that would have been a good thing. It may not have been, or it may have been, it could be an act of worship too, if they just did it on their own for whatever reasons, but by giving it to the apostles, I, I think there's an even bigger act of worship in the sense that they're relinquishing control and saying, you guys know what's best in relationship to the needs of others, and we'll talk about why I think they, they did, and, and you guys use it to help the needs of those others. But the fact that we can use it ourselves and use our own discretion in giving away benevolence, I think is indicated in the dialogue between Jesus and the rich young ruler. In Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 18, it says, Why do you call me good? This is Jesus talking to the rich young ruler. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. There's that idea of personal ownership. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud honor. Or honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since my boyhood. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now note he didn't say go and sell everything you have and take it to the rabbi and let them distribute it. And he said, well, that's because some of those rabbis weren't so honest <laughs> at that time. No, but he allows him to distribute whatever he sold and, and the proceeds of that to the poor on his own. And that's why I say I don't think it's mandated that you have to give it to the apostles or to the pastors or to the elders. You, you can decide to distribute some of uh, your benevolence on your own. It's, all, it's voluntary. It's voluntary. It's voluntary. But then you may say, well, then why did they give it to the apostles? Well, I've already hit on that in part. I think it was an act of worship. But I also think there were some pragmatic reasons I think there are some pragmatic reasons for why they gave it to the apostles. First of all, the apostles were traveling around the countryside preaching the gospel. Many of the people that they probably ministered to never got to do that. You know, we live in a day and age where everybody travels. I mean, how many of you are snowbirds? Raise your hand. How many of you are snowbirds? You look around. There's a lot. Now, you guys are crossing how many miles every year? Thousand, right? Nine hundred to 1,000, 1,200 miles? Those, those of you that are unfortunate enough to be Canadians, how, I mean, how, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> how, how far do you travel? Anybody from Canada? And no, no Canadians? Wow, I know we, we usually have some Canadians. Okay, I'm going to guess it's even further than that. And we're traveling all over the place. How many of you have never been outside of the greater Newport Ritchie, Port Ritchie, Hudson area? Is there anybody here that has never been out of Hudson, Newport Ritchie, or Port Ritchie? Well, throw, let's throw in Elfers. Let's, let's throw in Dade City. Okay. Every, how many have never been out of Pasco County? Must have, there's no little kids in here, right? How many of you have never been out of the state of Florida? You've never been out of the state of Florida. Is there anybody? Okay, so to leave the state of Florida from here, you've got to go what? At least 200 miles? to get to the Georgia border, right around 200 miles. So all of us have traveled. That. Do you realize that the whole country of Israel, the whole country of Israel isn't, it's only, I forget the exact dimensions, it's the size of New Jersey. I mean, it's not much longer than 200 miles if it's that. Somebody know the exact, I should know it, I was there once, <laughs> and I don't remember. But what I'm trying to point out is a lot of these people never traveled outside of their little towns. It's like a lady that worked for my mom and dad for 30 years, Lily Hill fantastic lady the kind of the kind of woman that you don't see much of anymore just a tough lady she was born in Elfers Florida now she's been dead for several years in fact her daughter-in-law is Rita Hill you may have seen some of her real estate signs around the area Rita Hill real estate Rita is Lily's daughter-in-law uh, Lily was I don't know she was in her 70s when we sold the cleaners when my mom and dad sold the cleaners she worked for them for 30 years, born and raised in Elfers, Florida. Had only been out of the state a couple times in her life. She made the big move from Elfers to Newport Ritchie, somewhere in her life, <laughs> five miles up the road. And for the most part, never left town. 
walk to and from work every single day, if she bought groceries, that's, I guess that's why I don't feel so sorry for people that have to walk a little bit. Because this lady into her 70s walked every day to work, walked every day from home. We would have to beg her to take her home if it was raining. Because she would bring an umbrella with her any day that she thought there was going to be rain. And she insisted that she could walk home on her own in the rain. And usually, at least once a week, she went next door to Potter Brothers IGA, which was right there on Main Street, right next to the dry cleaners. And she would go in, she'd get a couple bags of groceries, and she would walk home with her purse, her umbrella, and two bags of groceries. Now, if it wasn't raining, she didn't have to hold the umbrella. And you couldn't hardly talk her into letting you give her a ride. She's just a fantastic worker, and, and I'll use her as an example in something else, but almost never left the area. That's, that used to be commonplace. A lot of people grew up and lived and never went 30, 40, 50 miles outside of where they were born. The apostles were traveling all over the place. They knew about the needs of believers in places where these saints didn't know the believers. And even there just in the Jerusalem area, they may have had more experience with some of the people than that. And I think so, not only was it an act of worship, I think they also laid it at the apostles' feet for some pragmatic reasons. It's somewhat like we do today even. A lot of times we'll give money uh, to people going overseas. I know this last time when I went overseas, I won't mention what country, but uh, somebody, a church in New Jersey gave me $5,000 to take and deliver it to some of the believers there in that country. And they entrusted me with that. And that was in cash. And they sent me a check, but we cashed it. And I, they took it over in cash, $5,000, and, and gave it out to the leaders. Now, I, I made sure I gave a got a receipt from everybody that I gave money to so that I could provide all things honest in the sight of all men. And when I came back, I, I scanned those things on my computer and emailed the receipts to the various people. And, um, but that's what's going on here to some extent as well, that I think, that the apostles knew the needs of the saints in a wider geographical region than what many of the people may have known, and so there were some pragmatic reasons for it as well. There's another pragmatic reason. So one is act of worship. Two, pragmatic reasons. But there's another pragmatic reason, and I indicated this a little bit when I said that they knew the needs better. Because you see, the Bible says, if a man does not work, neither shall he eat. And the Bible gives some pretty strict criteria as to what a person in need is like. And if he's lazy, he doesn't fit the criteria. Did you catch that? If he's lazy, it doesn't fit the criteria. And I, I'm going to say this, sometimes the scriptures seem pretty harsh to me on who could be the recipient of Christian financial aid and who could not. And if they're lazy, let me read it to you again. 2 Thessalonians, you can write it down, chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. Government doesn't do that. That's why they're inefficient. And the church can do that. You know, and when you think about it, social security, welfare, any type of social government aid is pretty much a new phenomena to this century that we live in. You back up a few centuries and it was unknown of in most of the world. Certainly it was unknown of in ancient Rome. And people who were in need then were probably in a much greater need than they are today because today, if I'm, especially here in America, if I'm in need, I can go apply for welfare, I got food stamps, WIC. I mean, there's a whole, whole lot of social programs. I can get a free cell phone, you know that, right? You can't, but if my income is low enough, I can I mean, there are, also, there are government programs I know nothing about. And, and so to think that the apostles would say something like this in a day and age when nobody was getting Social Security, nobody was getting welfare, nobody was getting food stamps, nobody was getting WIC, nobody was getting free cell phones, and he still says, if a man does not work, neither shall he eat. Whoa. I don't know about you. That seems just a little bit tough. But that's what he says. And the, I think the people realized then that the apostles weren't just going to give out money to people who didn't really need money or people who would misuse it because there's other criteria. There's other criteria. Listen to what Paul says in relationship uh, to giving. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16, he says, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need, really in need, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. The widow who's really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. 
but the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In other words, he's saying, you know what? It's not the church's responsibility to take care of widows that have family. It's the family's responsibility. It's the children and the grandchildren. And even I, widows that belong in that family were to support older widows if they were related to them. Think of how hard that would be in this day and age, that day and age. Verse 9, no widow may be put on the list of widows. Now, this would be regular support at this point, regular support at this point. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60. You realize the lifespan was shorter back then, right? You realize they didn't have hip replacements, knee replacements, <laughs> steroid injections, ibuprofen, aspirin, Tylenol, whatever else. And yet the age here is 60. No widow could be put on the list for regular support from the church unless she was over 60. He goes on, though. He goes on. So they couldn't have family. They couldn't be over 60. And there's moral criteria. Now, this is almost unheard of in any type of social program, especially government social program. I watch on the Internet, and people are saying, hey, people that are on welfare ought to be drug tested before they get it. And people, ah, they can't do that. That's, that's un inhumane. Ah, and there's squawks and squeals and whines and moans and groans. And, Listen to this moral criteria, okay? She's got to be over 60. Has been faithful to her husband. Ooh, any promiscuous woman disqualified. And is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality. Now, these are just examples of good deeds. Washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of deeds. So now we got moral criteria as well. Attitude, it's got to be over 60 in a day and age when the lifespan was certainly shorter than it is today. She, she can't have any relatives, and she's got to be a morally good person or she doesn't qualify for any regular aid from the church. Wow, you think, I'm cold-hearted <laughs> in my giving, you know. I don't feel guilty by not giving a handout to the guy holding a sign on the corner. Have I ever done it? Yes. There have been rare occasions where I have. But I don't feel guilty when I don't, especially when they look able-bodied and young enough. I do not feel <coughs> guilty <coughs> because they could be working, I think. In my experience here, and I know Dave had it when he was the pastor here and probably up in Pennsylvania. Uh, well, yeah, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Church of the Open Door. Uh, you know, we have people coming in on a somewhat regular basis for benevolence aid. And most of the time, they're able to walk in through those two doors, open those doors by themselves, and they are mentally and physically capable, sometimes of doing much more than I am physically capable of. I can't do what Sean does, right? I can't go to the trampoline park anymore. <coughs> in my mind, I would still like to do that. <laughs> but I'm finally at that age where my body says, no way, Jose, <laughs> you will be hurting for a long time. And I just don't do it. Now, these are people that are coming in in their 30s sometimes, in their 40s, and they're looking for... I, one guy, one big strapping guy came into my office, came in under the pretext that he wanted some spiritual advice. I, I hate to be sarcastic and a little cynical, but I've gotten that way when it comes to benevolence, because all most, I would say 90% of the time, the people who come in looking for spiritual advice are coming in looking for a handout. When they come off the street, I'm not talking about you guys or someone that comes to church here. When they come off the street, that's usually a pretext to get into the office to talk to somebody about getting money. And this one day, this big strapping guy comes in, and, and he sits down, and he starts to talk to me a little bit, and finally he gets to the point where he says, I really need some money. And I said, okay, at this point in time, we were doing this. I said, we've got a weed eater back there, and if you don't know how to use it, I'll start it for you and show you, and I'll give you 10 bucks an hour uh, to do some weed eating around the church. And right away, oh, I can't do that. Why can't you do that? I'm on disability. I should have. Well, you got money there then. Goodbye. See you. <clears throat> I'm, uh, uh, actually, he said, I'm disabled. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm disabled. And I said, I'm looking at him. And I said, well, you, man, you look kind of big and strong. And you walked in here. Uh, how are you disabled? He said, I'm mentally disabled. Now, this was a person that I had no clue was mentally I just had a conversation with him for a half an hour, listened to some very interesting, manipulative type of arguments as to why he needed financial help 
and he's, man, if he's mentally disabled, so am I. <laughs> I don't think I could construe the, the arguments he construed that day. And so I said, I'm sorry then. I'm not going to help you. And that may seem hard-hearted, but if he's not willing to work and he's able to work, mentally disabled, how hard is it to work a weed eater? You know? I mean, come on. The scripture's pretty clear on it. I think they took it to the feet of the apostles in part for that reason as well. That the apostles, the apostles as spiritual, you know, we, sometimes we think spiritual means you just give to everybody that asks. Right? Don't we, some people think that way. Well, he's a pastor. He, I mean, if somebody asks him for money, he must give them money. You're just supposed to give it to everybody that asks. The scriptures don't teach that. The apostles didn't teach that. And, and, and so I think, it, again, in part, they gave it to the apostles, knowing that the apostles would know best how to use this money for people really in need, not just people who were looking for handouts because they didn't want to work. And there are people that are really in need today. I think there's a whole lot of people abusing the system and just looking for a free ride. I really do. But there are some people that for health reasons, injuries, accidents, uh, whatever, um, sometimes it's just being in a local economy that do doesn't have any way to make enough money to make the ends meet. They have maybe a poor education. Uh, they can't get a good job. They're working, but they're not able to pay all the bills. There are people that are really in need, and the church believers ought to help those people. I don't want you to walk away just thinking, oh, good, I can be more stingy. I heard it from pastor himself. <laughs> I got a whole list of criteria I'm going to ask these guys on the corner from now on. <laughs> No, oh, I, I want us to look at the positive of this instead. Uh, the, the generous attitudes they did have toward those who were really in need. And so what do we see here? We see unity and generosity and boldness that were all a result of the Holy Spirit's filling. We see a unity that's not only theological, but it's also of kindred heart. We see that sharing was voluntary and that their sharing was an act of worship and they entrusted it to spiritual leaders who they knew would distribute it in a manner that would be pleasing to God. By the way, I, 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 that's another reason why I, I don't think our governments can do that. Because they're not all spiritual. And there's all sorts of reasons why people give that aren't necessarily biblical reasons for giving. Some people just don't care. In fact, I think there's some people that pass laws just so they can get votes. That they'll They'll lobby for certain laws so they can get certain votes, and depending on the contingency from which they seek the votes depends sometimes upon what kind of laws they're willing to pass, and it has nothing to do with actually being fair and equitable. It's what will get me the votes. And with the apostles, they weren't running for office. They weren't up for election. There weren't mixed motives. They were honest men who had followed the Lord. These were men who had given up everything to follow Jesus, and they were going to use the money to help the saints in the best way possible, and that's why it was laid at their feet. Hopefully, hopefully as a believer, you will walk away today with this positive aspect of generosity, seeking to be like the early church was, even to the point of sacrifice, to help the needs of others. Let's pray. <clears throat> the Father in heaven, I think here in America that sometimes it's hard to do this because there are so many social programs we don't always.